make a small detour there, you know. <laughs> These bald guys, you sweat, you know. I don't have a hanky with me this morning, so I can pat that. So hopefully that will help uh, with it there. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Habakkuk. Uh, we're picking back up uh, in, our, in our study, the book of Habakkuk. I hope that uh, you are learning much through this study. Let me pray for us. There we go. Um, let me pray for us as we uh, look to God through His Word. Father, it's good to be here. It's, it's good to worship You. Uh, it's, it's good to uh, have Your people gathered together so that we might stand and proclaim Your promises. Certainly as we just sung, uh, Your promises are good, they're right, and they're fair. If, if anything, as we've even thought about last week, it was unfair for Christ to have our sins placed on Him and to take that punishment. But He willingly did so. So that we would no longer be at enmity with You, Lord, for those who, who trust in His gift of salvation, that He died on the cross, that He was buried and, and rose again the third day. That there's victory over sin. And so we, we come here celebrating this week just as much as we celebrated last week. And hopefully uh, we celebrate uh, each day in our lives. As we say often around here that before our feet hit the floor. That we might be praising you for the glorious gospel that has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And so may we be people who rejoice we may, may we be people who live the abundant life because we stand on your promises. We don't look to our own, we don't look to our own ways, but we think about you and your ways and live in your spirit to then uh, walk in by it rather than the flesh. And so as we come to your word this morning, we ask you to teach us. But Lord, we also ask that you would change us that we would respond to you, that we would submit to you, that we would say, yes, it's good to be under your authority and control yeah. so that we might walk in godliness. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, over the years, methods have changed, but the question remains the same. What are you listening to? In the mid-80s, I, I was arriving at baseball practice and jamming on my Walkman. If you don't know what a Walkman is, there's a picture of it. It's like this foreign device, but basically it plays music. And you maybe can kind of see the headphones. You kind of go, oh, headphones are similar. You can kind of see those today. And it's even interesting to see the retro ones that are coming back, the big old earmuffs, right, as far as hearing. But a couple seniors that I looked up to on the baseball team said, hey, Vince, what are you listening to? And I proudly responded, Armored Saint. And they were like, yeah, cool, bro. Now, I don't expect any of you to really know who Armored Saint, and that's okay. <laughs> I wasn't necessarily walking with the Lord always back then. Uh, but but that, was, that was like right on. And let me give you another 80s reference. It was like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And, and so I went on to practice, and I, I, I used that music to help me get in my... We didn't have walk-up music back then. I mean, they didn't have all these players that come to the bat, you know, and they got come to home play, and they got this walk-up music. I mean, it's interesting, even like when Zach was playing in high school, they had these big boom boxes that would just jam these tunes as they walked up. Well, we had to do ours ahead of time and then think about it as we, we, we went to the plate. But we don't use Walkmans today. It's, it's Spotify or Apple Music that answers the question, what are you listening to for us? These devices generate playlists of our most frequent artists and songs that we listen to. Chris Stapleton, another guy that maybe some of you don't know, but he's one of our culture's favorite artists in the country genre. And again, uh, his, his songs are, are more popular, but one of them is, what are you listening to? And so let me give you, you know I like quoting philosophers, I call these musicians philosophers, but here's what he is writing. Is it a cover band in some college town bar, or is it something to get you through? Tears still fall and hearts still breaking because you're hanging on. Or is it love song about someone new, 
I like to believe that you're just like me, trying to figure out how a good thing goes bad. I don't know. I can't let it go. Yeah, it's about to drive me mad. It's a feel-good song getting you to drive too fast. The one that gets you moving on pass to pass. What are you listening to? You see, music is about a message. There are different types of music, but songs influence our beliefs, they evoke our emotions, and they move people into action. He's alluding to this song is the music's causing him to drive too fast. Now, some musicians are in it for the money, while others seek fame. But then there are those who are, are, are artists. They want to use their platform to <laughs> convey a message. Why do we sing in here each week for our service? Well, we want to proclaim a message. If I say to you, he lives, he lives. See, music influences. Music teaches. Now, some of you know that because it's a hymn. Some of you don't know that because it's a hymn, right? <laughs> but either way, whether it's hymns, contemporary music, music teaches us. I don't know about you, but I imagine during the middle of this week, that little ditty that you were playing there in that second song, I'm sure that's going to come back to my memory. I know that the 80s music that I listened to back then comes back to my mind way too often because music's about teaching. It's about teaching a message, and it helps us to remember. And so what are you listening to? Rock, classical, country, or any other genre is not as important as whom you are listening to. As people, we have all types of guiding influences in our lives, proclaiming a message of self rather than God. The world believes that the chief end of man is, well, self-worship. Not worship of the one true God alone. And God's warning this morning is about guiding influences. God denounces the idols of, in Babylon. And it may have seemed like their guiding influences had more power than the God of Israel. But I want you to understand, and God wanted the people of Israel to understand, there's a vast difference between the two. It's no different for us in our worship today. Idols are guiding influences in our lives, and they compete in our hearts. Will we worship the one true God, or will we worship self? Or will we worship the things of, that have been created rather than the Creator? Idols have no power and have no value. That's what we're going to hear today. And so if we're not careful, these worldly influences guide our lives rather than God. I mean, isn't that why God made the first two commandments what He did? He knows that we're prone to wander. He knows that we are made to worship, but yet we worship the created rather than the creator. This is Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water below. You shall not bow down to them. Here's the key one. Or serve them. In this final warning to Habakkuk and Israel about guiding authorities, God identifies idolatry as the source of Babylon's previous actions. What seems like a victory is, is no victory at all. And isn't that what idols do? They overpromise and they underdeliver. And so if you haven't turned to Habakkuk 2, verses 18 through 20, do so now as we will read from God's Word. <coughs> Habakkuk 2, verses 18 through 20. God's warning regarding improper influences in our lives. What good is an idol? Why would a craftsman make it? Was it what good is metal image that gives misleading oracles? Why would its creator place his trust in it and make such mute, worthless things? Woe to the one who says to wood, wake up. And he, and he who says the speechless stone, awake. Can it give reliable guidance? 
Is it overlaid with gold and silver? It has no life's breath inside it. But the Lord, don't you love that? But the Lord is in his majestic, majestic palace. The whole earth is speechless in his presence. And so the first thing I'd like you to see this morning is the inferiority of idols. This is verses 18 and 19. The inferiority of idols. Habakkuk employs a stylistic change in this woe. When you look at the other woes, it was right at the beginning. And so here they are. Woe to him who, weep, who heaps up what is not his own. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house. Woe to him who builds a town with blood. And woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. I believe these four woes come out of this final woe, which is idolatry. Idolatry is what's feeding all these other desires and actions in the Babylonians. And so for stylistic change, Habakkuk doesn't hit them with the woe right out of the gate. He's building towards it in verse 19. And so that's what we're seeing this morning, are, are rhetorical questions that expect a negative answer. These are not to be affirmed, but he's saying this is the improper way. And so what good is an idol? Well, it has no value at all. It is useless in its purpose. Well, what good is a metal image? Metal images mislead. They do not speak the truth. In some of your Bibles, it might even say they are teachers of lies or deceitfulness. Therefore, idols are problematic. They do not produce, they do not produce reliable guidance. One cannot trust or rely on it for help. Why? Well, idols are without power and strength. Now, for us, we, we, we get that. And most people, they do not struggle with, with carved or, or poured images. But that does not mean that people do not struggle with imaging God in their lives. See, that's what idol in the Word is about. It's about a false imaging. It's about a false worship. It's deceitful at very best and teaches you not God's ways, but man's ways. Idolatry is giving into the temptation to worship that which is false. There's one true God. You're either worshiping the one true God or you're worshiping something else or someone else. You're never at this this pause, neutral, to where you're worshiping nothing. You're always worshiping something. You were designed to worship. And so the question is, are you worshiping the one true God, or are you worshiping something that is false? The world follows self. It, it, it's influenced by its own rational own rational thinking, own justifications. Think, think about this for a second. He gives the imagery of trees and rocks here. They don't talk. Right? Have you ever heard a tree talk? Now, I know some people claim to hear trees talk, but have you ever heard a tree talk? Have you ever heard a, a rock talk? The text says that they are mute. And so if they are mute, Who's doing the talking? Now, some of you may go, oh, pastor, you know, Psalm 19, 1 through far. That's what we're talking about here. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky displays His handiwork. Day after day, it speaks out. Night after night, it reveals His greatness. There is no actual speech or word, nor its voice literally heard, yet its voice echoes throughout the earth. I agree wholeheartedly. But is that what most people are thinking about? when they think about trees and rocks? Are they saying it declares the glory of God, His majestic being? Or does it say, eh, we were evolved. This stuff just kind of got thrown together, just kind of happenstance. If it's people, people silence God by worshiping the created rather than the creator. Our heart's desires are, are giving the meaning to the items that can't talk. Well, how is this done, you ask? Well, it's by whatever a person places their trust in. It is something that is viewed as good or valuable. 
Let me show you some warnings from God's word. A major problem in life is to trust in riches. You cannot serve God and money, for you will serve one or the other, not both. Have you ever heard money talk to you? I'm not talking about ACDC. I mean, no. Right? Does money actually talk? But isn't that what people say? Money talks. If you want to get actions in this world, it, it takes money. But it doesn't literally talk to you, does it? Proverbs 11, 28. The one who trusts in his riches will fall. But the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Let me give you another improper trust. How about we trust in mankind? Jeremiah 17, 5. The Lord says, I will put a curse on people who trust in mere human beings, who depend on mere flesh and blood for what? Their strength. And whose hearts have turned away from the Lord. I could take you to a plethora of other categories of misplaced trust in the created over the creator. But these items are basic, and so let me just go deeper into the water. Let's talk about the problem of misplaced trust in God. This is Jeremiah 7, verses 2 through 5. Listen to the Lord's message. All you people of Judah who have passed through these gates to worship the Lord. See, it sounds good, right? These people are coming to worship the Lord. And so uh, at the beginning, it's like this has got some, some hope here. Hear what the Lord has to say. We're talking about idols being mute, but the Lord is not mute. Hear what the Lord has to say. The Lord of God of Israel, who rules over all, says, Change the way you have been living and do what is right. If you do, I will allow you to continue to live in this land. Stop putting your confidence, trust, in the false belief that says, We are safe. The temple of the Lord is here. The temple of the Lord is here. The temple of the Lord is here. You must change the way you have been living and do what is right. But what happened? They got the boot, right? Was the temple of the Lord safe? The Babylonians came in and destroyed it. Wiped it out. But what was their false belief in? That if we can do whatever we want in our worship, because God said this was not going to be wiped out. But they forget the conditional aspect. If you obey my laws, if you worship me and me alone, if you put no other gods before you, if you make no carving images, and what was the first thing they were doing while well, Moses is up the mountain getting the Ten Commandments? Carving images, right? Gold calf. It just appeared. There's a misplaced trust here. God will do anything to me for my disobedience because I'm an Israelite and I'm one of God's chosen people. We still see this today. No, we don't do it with regards to you know, disobedience to worshiping idols of the carved or poured version. But think about Romans 6, 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Are we to remain in sin so that grace may increase? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? And so since idols cannot talk, people start doing the talking regarding the beliefs and messages we trust in. You know, just this one time, it's not going to hurt anybody. It won't affect you. What I do affects me. It has no effect on you. Is that true? little white lie is no big deal. But there's an underlying heart condition, isn't there? That accompanies this. That is, I am in control, not God. I am the authority, not God. It is worship of self and not God. You see, the idols we create may not be carved or poured images, but they are just as dangerous because we make the standards of our way of life rather than God. We say that this is how we're going to let live because this is the desire that I have. And so my actions follow that instead of the one true God. The shiny gold and silver give the illusion of life 
when in reality, it is dead. There's no breath. Do you see that in verse 19? It says that there's no breath. I hope to you right now, the images of Genesis come to your mind. That we are made in what? The image of God. And how did that happen? He breathed breath into our nostrils and gave us life, not death. People are different than everything else that God created. He gave us this life so that we would have abundant life, not death. Now, again, I get it. We talk about idols and we still have a hard time with how this all fits into my, my practical life. And so this is the easiest way, or the best way I know to try to help people understand how they have to work at idolatry in their life. That each and every one of us is working through idolatry in our life. Because if I say to you, as 1 John 5, 18 says, guard your hearts from idols, you're like, ah, I got it done. It's not a big deal. I'm not, I'm not worshiping a golden calf. I'm, I don't make any images. I'm not carving things out of wood. I don't have to worry about it. It's just not true. And so let me use some different language to help you think through inordinate ruling desires. This is Robert Jones. He was studying the Puritans and he, he learned how they talked about inordinate desires. We are to have good desires in our life. Right? And so what we're saying here is that God is in control of everything. God is Lord. He's the sovereign Lord. Authority over all. And so this chair is the representation of God's throne. Becca, maybe I could use your help someday and create some better PowerPoint slides. But she's in the nursery right now. Yeah, anyways, you can tell her later. But this is my cheap way of doing it, is that there's a throne here. You see the stairs? That's the staircase up to the throne. And who's sitting on the throne right now? The cross, which we're saying is representation for Christ. So when Christ is on the throne, and you see these letters beneath it, these can be good desires. Be good desires. A good desire is to work. We're not supposed to be lazy sluggards, right? We're called to work. But a good desire, as long as this desire stays under the authority of Christ, it's not a problem. And so that means what? We take a day of rest. We put God before us. We trust Him for riches. We don't trust in ourselves for riches. We don't go build more barns and barns and barns and think about, right, that whole parable? We trust in God to provide for us. And so we say we work when God calls us to work, and we rest when God calls us to rest. But when we become a workaholic, what we see happening here is this good desire has come up the throne and knocked Christ off the throne. Christ is no longer in control of our lives. Work is in control of our lives. We need more money, and we justify it. Oh, we got bills to pay. I have mouths to feed. I have... But doesn't God say that he will provide your every need? Well, that's, you know, yes, he says that, but, you know, we're called to work. Now, I could do this with children. Children are a blessing of the Lord. We can say that children are a good desire. And as long as Christ is in the center of the family, good deal, right? But when children come up the throne to where they are the ones controlling the family... It's an inordinate desire. Children are now being what's worshipped. And so everything is done as, well, what do you think, Johnny, that we should do today? Or Johnny, what do you think we should have for dinner? Or Johnny, you're John Johnny's the one that's making all the decisions. But who is given the responsibility to parent? Well, some people want to say pastors. No. <laughs> Parents. Parents are responsible for parenting their children. Parents are responsible for, for teaching them as I walk, as I go, as I sit, how to worship the one true God. Think Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, right? To worship them with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength. They catch that way better in the family than they do in the church. The church is to help the family, but not to replace the family. But it becomes an inordinate desire when these good desires of all these various things come up and knock Christ off the throne. Because they're now the authority, not Christ. And so does that help you think through idolatry better? How you can love money 
How you can love work, how you can love children. Are we called to love our children? Yes. I'm not saying pastor said that just don't worry about what little Johnny says ever. No. But we can't let them be the ruler, the authority. Children do not have sovereign control over the family. God does. When children run the family, it's a problem. It's a problem. And so some of the ways to help us think through this, because you're still like, I, I, I'm getting it, and I get the visualization. Thanks for the pictures, because we learn through pictures better, don't we? <clears throat> so let me give you some questions to help us think through this. Is it consuming your mind? Are you always thinking about it? Are you obsessed about it? As all I do is I think, 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 think. Does that show a trust in God? Are you trying to take over responsibilities that are not your responsibilities? Is that why anxiety is here? Is that why depression is here? Because I can't control. In fact, I can only control that child of mine. Am I willing to sin to get this? Am I willing to sin if I think I'm going to lose this? You know, I, I use the illustration of a job application. I need this job. I want this job. This is a good paying job. And so what I do, he's asking that I have experience here or training here. But, you know, I kind of have some. I watch some YouTube videos. And so I'll put on my application that I do have experience and I do have training in this. What is that? Lying. Why am I lying? So I can control the situation on whether I get the job or not. But who's really in control whether you get that job or not? The sovereign Lord. Are you trusting God that if you write what's truthful on the application, that even if you don't have the experience they're looking for and God wants you in that place, that God will work in the hearts of even unbelievers so that you will be in that position? Amen. Amen. Yes. These questions are so helpful. We need to inspect our hearts, brothers and sisters. Too many times we have idols in there and we don't even realize it because we couch it in terms of, of, of Bible talk. And we think that we're doing something godly when in reality we've blended it with the world's ideas, the world's ways. That's what's going on here. That, that was the, the, the fear of, of when Israel was put in captivity for 70 years. And they worshiped the one true God, but then at the same time, there was all these Babylonian idols. And these idols influenced them, and they conflated the two, and they brought the two together. And so my question is to you, who is ruling your heart? Who is on the throne? And again, our heart is our inner being. You won't find a picture of Jesus in there in your heart. He doesn't actually, you know, let's, let's not use this terminology that the world uses. It's our inner being. Who's ruling that? Who's in control? What you trust in is critical for life. Psalm 62, 8. Trust in Him at all times, not sometimes. Do you trust God in every situation of your life? Or do you say, you know what, I know the Bible says this, but this one situation, I think that I can do this instead of this. Because it's too difficult to, to do this in my life, but it's a lot easier to do this in my life. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before Him. God is our shelter. Do you believe that? That if you do the right thing and you think people might come to harm you, that God will still protect you? Because isn't that it? The fear of man keeps us from doing what God has called us, keeps us from trusting in God because we're, we're, we don't think there's a protection there. But what's the text say? He is our shelter. He is sovereign over all. No idols have any power or any good or any purpose to them. But why do we fall? and temptation to them over and over and over again. It's false worship. It's, it's false worship. It appeared that the Babylonians were winning, that they conquered Israel, 
And they were giving credit to their gods. We saw earlier in chapter 2, in verse 1, they were like, oh man, these Babylonians and their gods, they are monsters, man, of the midway. They're so good. They're so powerful. They're so all these things. And so they were giving credit to their gods. But as we heard in Habakkuk, no one is outside of God's plan. This was particularly an aspect of God's plan. That God was in control. And so do you believe that for your life? That, that God is in control? Well, here is Isaiah 21.9. Look what's coming. A charioteer, a team of horses. When questioned, he replies, Babylon has fallen, they have fallen. All the idols of her gods lie shattered on the ground. Idols over promise and under deliver. There's no power. There's no value. And so why do we trust Him? When we can trust in the incomparability of God. Look at verse 20. The incomparability of God. But the Lord is in His majestic palace. The whole earth is speechless in His presence. The contrast is stark here. There's a brief appearance of the, as if Babylonians were winning and their many gods were superior, but the reality is there is no one like God. There is only one true God, and He is still on the throne. What we celebrated last week at Easter continues throughout the year. That God is still on the throne. But just put yourself in, the, in their place for a second. The temple meant everything to the Jew. The presence of God dwelt in the temple, and Babylon destroyed it. When sin is winning in our lives, and we feel so defeated, can you understand the temptation to doubt God's power? Is God really going to provide? If I give what God's called me to give in finances to the church, will I be able to live throughout the week? Why be able to live throughout the month? Will God really provide? You know, it's not a big deal. There's other people at the church. God can use them. He's gifted them and they can give and I don't have to give. What's that? Self-talk. That's self-worship. That's a lack of trust in the one true God who is Lord over all. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, Never ever forget that God is on the throne. Jesus is at the right hand side of the Father, ruling. He's not up there asleep. He's not off looking into another universe. He's right here, right now. He gave us His Holy Spirit. His presence is with us. Isn't that true about New Testament believers? Isn't that where the temple is in believers? It's no longer in Jerusalem. What, isn't that what Jesus said in John 2.19? Where he says, destroy this temple and what three days it'll be built. And so, Jesus' body is the temple as well. But now, it's the body of believers. God is on the throne. And, and notice what the future will be. Because we talk about the past and we kind of talk about the present. But let me just show you what the future will be. This is Revelation 21 and 22. Now I saw no temple in the city because the Lord God, the all-powerful, sovereign Lord over all, and the Lamb are its temple. And so since no one will knock God off his throne, the question becomes, will you let God speak? Will you let God speak into your life? Let's go back to the situation here with Habakkuk. Chapter 1, there's this dialogue going back and forth, but Habakkuk's doing a lot of the talking, isn't he? And what was he questioning? God's sovereignty. God's power. And we get this back and forth dialogue going on, but then after this happens, what's, what does Habakkuk do? Well, let me remind you, this is verse 1 of chapter 2. I will stand at my watch post. I will remain stationed on the city wall. I will keep watching so I can see what he says to me. And can know 
how I should answer when he counters my argument. So my question to you is, do you let God speak into your life? Are you waiting on God? Or is your life so busy, 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 busy that you don't wait on God? You don't look for his answers. You don't hear from him. See, we hear all the time. We're listening all the time. The question is, whom are you listening to? Are you listening to God and His ways through His Word? Or are you listening to the world? It's that simple. You will listen to one or the other. And so, whom are you listening to? You know, some people are like, what are we doing here at the beginning of the service? Well, why do we take this 30 second break? But sometimes we go a minute, and that's like really long. Because I just, I know, what am I supposed to think of the whole time while I sit there and there I look around and see what other people are doing? And no, are you getting your heart prepared to listen to the one true God? Are you, are you ready for Him to speak into your life? Or are you like, ah, I'm doing my good deed, man, I've gone to church four weeks, you know, four times this month. Do you want to hear God speak to you? Do, you? do you believe that God speaks to you through His Word? Through His people? And yes, even creation, when we worship the Creator and not the created. There's so many ways that we can let God speak into our lives, but there's so many ways in which we block Him. We need to remember to let God talk. And not all these other voices. This is one reason why we started the counseling ministry at CBC. Studies show that believers, a higher percentage of them than you'd like to think, go to psychologists or psychotherapists. And some of these folks are, are Christians. And some of those folks who are Christians use God's word. But if they're not using God's word then what word are they speaking? It's important for us to distinguish that. Who is doing the speaking? Is it God or is it man? On top of that, if they're an unbeliever, it's even worse. This is 1 Corinthians 2. The unbeliever does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The one who is spiritual discerns all things, yet he himself is understood by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to advise him? But we believers have who? The mind of Christ. So, so why are we going to them when we have Christ? Why are we going to them when we have God's Word? Do, do you really believe that His divine presence has given us everything for life and godliness or not? What are you trusting in? Since we know that idols cannot speak, it means that we are doing the speaking most of the time. Wood or stone, money or status, they cannot talk. But our desires for money, our desire for status, our desire to be loved, our desire for, for power, you better believe that they speak loudly to us. But it's no contrast. It's no, or it's no comparison is what I meant to say. Because the whole earth is speechless in His presence. This is 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through 18. And what mutual agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will live in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore... 
Come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and I will welcome you. Shalom. Peace. God's peace will be with you. God's peace and His Holy Spirit will be directing you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters, says who? The all-powerful all Lord. Sovereign creator over everything. We may not struggle with idols of wood and stone, but that doesn't mean we struggle with idolatry. John Calvin is known for saying, the human heart is an idol factory. Idols are deceitful, and we are prone to water. Idols lure us away to listen to everything else but God. This is why it's so important then for us to inspect our hearts. We need to see what's really in there. And so what is our belief? Do we really believe that God alone is trustworthy or do our actions demonstrate that something else is what we're trusting in, someone else is what we're trusting in? But that needs to belief, be our belief, that God alone is trustworthy. What's our desires? Well, truth. Truth is what's going to help us live the best life, to have the abundant life. That's why we are the branches and Christ is what? The vine. We have abundant life when we're tapped into the vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we live in our lives in regards to truth, or we live in our lives in regards to something else. What's your desire? Do you desire to pursue truth in your life, or do you desire to, to pursue comfort in your life? Because when you desire truth, it will make for sticky situations in your life to where it's going to be uncomfortable. And so, do you really desire truth and living for God, truth for life? I know, Alistair Begg stole that from me. You got from God's work both, right? But is that what you're living for? Or are you living really for, is your, do you desire that? Are you like, ah, I'm kind of living for that kind of next tier down, the so-called truth, because so-called truth is easier to follow than the truth truth, right? What's the action? I, I, listen to God. I know you've heard this a hundred times, but here's the 101th time. Listen is not just an audible action. It's not that I physically hear with my ears. You this morning, right now, are physically hearing with your ears. Now, what are you going to do with your actions? Listening involves response to the truth, to where I live in light of the truth. You've heard me say this before, I'll say it again. When the mother screams at the child in the middle of the road, get out of the road, she doesn't go, oh good, he heard me. Thank you. But, oh, praise the Lord, he jumped out of the way of that bus coming. There's a response. Don't touch the stove. That red thing, it's hot. Ooh. Right? And, and so listening is a response. Are you responding to God's truth in your life? And so because of God's word, my next steps today, I need to inspect my heart. Idols are deceiving. I don't know how many times I've been deceived by an idol. Okay? And so we shouldn't be like, Wow, dude, you got deceived? Wow, you're not very spiritual. <clears throat> we all get deceived. Amen. There's not one of us in here that are not battling an idol right now. That's why I believe it's so important to equip this body with understanding what idols are, because they're not little images. They're, I mean, they're not these little uh, like dolls or you know uh, statues, <clears throat> but they're these desires that control us versus God. And so we need to inspect. We have blind spots in our lives, don't we? And so we're not coming alongside to try to judge one another. We're trying to show love to one another and help them see the blind spots. Let's let God speak. Too often we're, we're rattling. We're doing all the speaking. Have some quiet time. Can you please say no to one more thing? We're always filling our schedules. 
Or we're, we're filling our schedules with things that are just, I mean, we can start, I can start stepping on toes, we can start talking about entertainment, and we can start talking about all our, our crutches, all these things that, you know, what did you spend with 12 hours yesterday? You know, we, we can start going in all those things, right? But do we take time to let God speak? Oh, I couldn't do my devotions this week. You know, that's one of the number one things that people don't, that they, they drop. They, they drop reading God's word. That means they drop having God speak to them. Well, I still pray to him. But are you doing more of the talking and praying? Or are you listening to God back? And then worship God alone. This all affects our worship. Are, are, are we imaging God properly? Are we representing Him well? Are we falling to worship of the things that were created rather than the Creator? Father, thank you for this time just to teach us yet again about idolatry. And certainly, we talk too much. Lord, help us to be, to be quiet before you. Even before we read our Bibles on our own, may we pray that you would meet with us, that you would speak to us through your word. Everything that we go searching for in this world, it's speechless. There's no comparison to you. And so help us to, to know this truth and help us to, to follow this truth so that we might live the abundant life. Because we understand idols will always let us down. They overpromise and they underdeliver. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.